50 minutos, né, mais ou menos? Ah, ok. Melhor mesmo. Provavelmente 50 minutos seria o suficiente. Né? Uhum. Okay, so, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to come here and present this work. So it's a very recent work. It was recently published in uh, Nano Letters. It was made in collaboration with other uh, experimental groups from Massachusetts. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about here is the magnetic field dependence of excitonic transitions in monolayer uh, tungsten the selenide. And what I'm going to show here is already like a, uh, a this work is, is finished already. I mean, this one is, is OK. But there are many other results that are related to this, which are not fully understood. So what I'm going to show here is not only like uh, uh, advertising the results and so on and the technique, but also like a call for help. So if people can help to understand what is, what is going on in these experiments, that would be very nice, I guess. So I'm going to like to call your, uh, your attention to this problem of what is the magnetic field dependence of these exciton energy peaks in, in the spectroscopy of 2D materials. So uh, I come from this group, this uh, uh, condensed matter theory group, Grupo de Teoria da Matéria Condensada, from uh, the Federal University of Ceará. So some other people here in the, in the audience, they also come from there, some students from our, our department there, but also professors Diego, Gil, Jean-Lex, and Milton. Uh, not all of them uh, helping in this uh, work here, but I, I just wanted to show you the, the more or less the size of the group. But here in this work specifically, we got some also some support from the Christian Thielsen group in, in Denmark and some people from the Technical University of Dresden uh, in Germany. So uh, they, they mostly they do the DFT part of my calculations. Normally what I do is the... Uh, the continuum models for the for the theory. Okay, so maybe I should talk about this very quickly because uh, it, it we have like a but this is a 2D materials meeting, so I don't need to advertise so much the idea, right? But we know that uh, it started in 2004 when people could exfoliate a, a single layer of graphene, and then they they realized that it's possible to have a 2D crystal and so on that is stable. And then in 2009, they started to discuss also about boron nitride because they, they also have like layers with Van der Waals interactions between them. So you could, in principle, get a 2D material out of, that, out of that. And then in 2010, they realized that it's possible to do the same, like to get monolayer materials. Although this one is like three layers of atoms, but let's say this is a single layer of a transition metal decalcogenite. And, the, and this one is a semiconductor. This is nice because uh, graphene was a, a semi-metal, and this one is more like an insulator, right? The, the gap is very high, and this one, the gap is already like in the in the uh, like around red to yellow. So, uh, is it time? Uh, okay. So that that would be uh, good for electronics or optoelectronics and so on, right? And then in 2014, they uh, th they realized that, that you could you could also do the same thing with black phosphorus. This one was already introduced by Professor Milton yesterday, and this is also like a material that it, 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 it's even like an elementary material like graphene. That's he, this one is only with carbon, right? But this one is only with phosphorus, and like uh, weak interactions, uh, Van der Waals interactions in between the layers, so it's easy to exfoliate them and so on. And nowadays, people have been thinking about these uh, Van der Waals heterostructures. I'm going to talk a little bit in the end of the of the uh, of this talk about these uh, van der Waals heterostructures where you kind of mix some of these materials like that so you put together some graphene and, and in, the, in my case I'm going to talk only about mixing uh, TMDCs so the focus here will be more on TMDCs it's transition metal decalcogenite so these are materials that are composed by a transition metal and two calcogens so this would be like Transition metal would be like a molybdenum or tungstenum. There are some others like the tellurium, rhenium, and so on. But most most of the works uh, I've 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 been looking at, they are they use molybdenum or tungstenum for uh, optoelectronics and exciton properties and so on. 
And the chalcogen is normally like sulfur or selenium. But sometimes they, 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 they have other stuff here also for as a chalcogen. But normally it's selenium and, and sulfur. So the nice thing about this is that when you have the bulk of this, this kind of material, they are not uh, direct gap semiconductors. But once you exfoliate them in a, in a monolayer, then they, they start to have a, a direct gap. And this was uh, verified experimentally. And also people knew uh, that from theory already, like when they, they calculate the band structure, what, what you can see there is that if you have a bulk material, then you have an indirect, indirect gap like that. So there is like in the middle of the way between K and gamma, the, this is the minimum of conduction band. But as you exfoliate in a, in a monolayer, this thing goes down, this thing goes up, and this one goes down, and then you get a, a direct gap. Although the energy is really close, but it's uh, still like the lowest energy state would be here. And there in the uh, optoelectronics or, or in the absorption experiments with these materials, you see even like if you have a gate over the material, then you can see it going from like, there is a peak here for a negative trion, which is like an exciton with an extra charge, or a positive trion. And if you have a neutral point, then you, get a, you, you can get an exciton or a trapped exciton. So there are many things to, to try to understand in these materials. But this was done like in 2014, this one. But since 2010, 2013, people have, have been already jumping into this kind of, of, of peaks and to, to verify which each peak of that is, is composed of. So uh, that, that problem is more or less solved. What I'm going to talk about here is how this exciton peak changes with magnetic fields. So that's the, the point. So in order to, to uh, make the, the question a little more uh, interesting, I'm going to say that there are two ingredients that would make this question more interesting. Uh, it's the fact that in this kind of material, when you look at the crystal structure and you look at the Brillo one zone and so on, you see that it looks like the one of graphene. Then you have like uh, gaps at the K points, right? And these gaps, they are coupled in some interesting way. So they are like related by time reversal symmetry, just like in graphene, right? But also they have like spin properties that depend on the, on the cones. So here you have like in one cone, if you have plus half of spin for electron and minus for the whole, then here it's, it's switched, the signs, right? And also there is another uh, ingredient here is the fact that different light polarization, they access different cones. So if I have light polarized circularly in one direction, it will form excitons only in this cone. But if, life, if light is polarized in the, in the other direction, in, uh, in the other circular direction, so the, the you'll, have, you'll be able only to assess this one. And this has been verified already. I, I'm not sure if I put a slide about that, but uh, no, not yet. Uh, I mean, not, not I didn't put here, but if it's easy to find in the literature explanation for why that happens. So what I'm going to, to talk about now is that if you have light polarized in one direction or in the other direction, you access a state that has some magnetic moment uh, features and in, in the other cone, the magnetic moment will be reversed, right? So that's how you can see something like uh, uh, valetronics in the system. You can like access energies that are related only to this cone or to this cone, and they behave differently under a magnetic field. That's what I'm going to discuss here. So in what I'm looking for is the Zeeman effect and diamagnetic shift tr uh, in, in transition metal dichalcogenite, uh, uh, especially for excitons in in transition metal dichalcogenides. So this is what I'm looking for. And how did this thing go, uh, really start? It was in 2014, there was an experiment with uh, molybdenum diselenide. And there, they used absorption, uh, absorption spectro spectroscopy. And there in the absorption spectrum, they could find a peak that is related to the neutral exciton, like electron and hole bound together in the semiconductor but also a peak that is related to the trion shift. This is the red one. And as a function of a magnetic field, they apply the field from minus 10. They could find this uh, slope here. And this slope, this would be like a Zeeman effect, right? This is a linear dependence of the exciton peak on the uh, magnetic field. And indeed, if you 
put a light polarized in one direction or in the other direction, the slope goes down or up, which means that the magnetic moment of this state is different from this one. Of course, they are like in, in uh, time reversal uh, uh, symmetry related cones. So the G factor, if you look at these slopes, is going to be around four. And uh, this is as expected. And they even mentioned that, ah, that that's, that's fine because you found four and this is what you expect. Why do we expect this, this one to be four? It's because when you look at the bind, the bind structure, and this you can calculate that with uh, with DFT, then you look at the bind stru the, the band structure in this case for molybdenum disulfide, and but the ones for the other materials they are similar to. If you look at the contribution of e each state here, this is what would form the exciton, right? This is the conduction band and valence band, so electrons would be here, hold here. So by uh, uh, d orbitals of the molybdenum atom or the, the, the transition metal atom. Because if you look at the, the, the projections over the p state, in this case it would be the p states of the solar systems, or the s states in general, these would be very small, the contributions are very small. So mostly they are in the d orbitals. And actually electrons are mostly in the dz squared orbi orbital. So uh, Holes are the ones that are in the dxy, dxy squared, dx squared, y squared. So the holes are in these orbitals. And if you look at the mo magnetic momentum of these orbitals, the ones for the conduction band would be L, uh, uh, Lz would be zero for them. And Lz for these valence band states, it would be two. And now if you couple this thing to the uh, energy or to the, the uh, magnetic moment here, then you, you multiply by B, you get some effective G factor. This G factor will be like two for the K valley minus two for the other uh, valley. So uh, they would sum up to this four and that's it. So that's why that's four. It's because the magnetic moment for one valley is two and the other one is minus two. You sum them, it's, it's going to be four. So that sounded like the end of this story, right? But the problem is when people started to look for different materials or for different situations of the material, then for example, this one would be tungstenium diselenite. They observed not four, but 4.37. And this was really consistent. You, you can see that from the uh, error bars here. So this line is really like 4.37. So where does this 437 come from? You get a G, G factor that it's even like, a, a, a it's not, not even in inter integer. So it's a little bit weird, right? So why is that? So they started to see some unexpected values for this G factor. So read there in this paper that was even mentioned there in, in this paper is, is like that. So we have many contributions for this, this angular momentum. One contribution would be the uh, anomalous Zeeman effect that comes from spins. Uh, but that contribution would be zero, right? Because if you look at the, uh, you apply a magnetic field, then you have a spin-up electron. These, the energy of this spin-up electron would go up. But then you look at this one, the energy of this whole state here, it also has a spin-up, right? Because uh, the light is not uh, expected to, sp to flip the spin of the hole in the electron here. So the electron-hole pair should have the same spins for electrons and holes. So this one would also go up. And the G factor of a Zeeman effect is always the same. It's like a, a, a free particle G factor. So the contribution that you get up here and up here, th this would make the absorption energy, it doesn't, it, it doesn't change with this, this uh, effect, right? And also in, the, in minus K, then the spin is down, but then ES go down, ES go down here, and they go down by the same amount. So they, they don't contribute uh, th contributes to the, the, the overall energy. So you don't need to, to care about spins in this case. So it's not the spin that is making the correction. Now we can think about this, uh, uh, sigma plus and sigma minus uh, contributions coming from the intra, intra, uh, intra valley is or, or intracellular. I mean, intracellular state that would be what they call intra here is the contribution of the atoms it themselves, the uh, orbitals of the atoms themselves. So this is a contribution that for the electron is going to give you zero, and for the hole it's going to be minus two here and plus two here. And this would give, give you like uh, something that goes down here and up here. These are the, the things that will make this overall gap here 
be larger for k and smaller for k prime. And that's why they get these different Zeeman effects. But this one only explains the four, right? Now there is this extra contribution that has been suggested by this paper. Uh, there is this intercellular contribution. So what does that mean? This is the fact that you, you don't have just a, an orbital there. You actually have a, a, a lattice. This is not a single atom, right? It's a lattice of atoms. And then this lattice of atoms, it has like a, some band structure. And then now you have a contribution of the electron itself as if it was a, a, a free electron, right? But now with a different effective mass. That contribution, in principle, it should be an angular momentum that depends on one over the mass. If you go for the calculations of a magnetic moment of a free particle, that would be more or less one over the mass. And people have been neglecting, neglecting that, even in that PRL paper that I showed as the first one. There they neglect it because one over the mass for electrons in molybdenum disulfide and one over the mass for holes is the same number, more or less. Because in molybdenum disulfide, effective masses are more or less the same. So the contribution here and here would be more or less the same, and then this wouldn't uh, have a big effect in this, in this, uh, in this material. But actually, in tungstenium dicelanide, the, the masses, they are different. And then this contribution here is different from this one. So there will be like electron will go up a little bit and hole will go up a little less. And then here electrons will go down a little bit and, and holes will go down a little less. And this will give you an extra contribution. So this is the contribution I'm looking for. The contribution that is more or less related to one over the mass. Okay? So this would be like contribution that is called inter intercellular because this is not only coming from a single atom. It comes from the fact that you have a a lattice of atoms, and because of that, the electron behaves as a free particle. That is the idea. So now let's let's go for other experiments that see stuff like that. This one, uh, this one was, was really weird. Although the, the group is very uh, precise in their in their uh, in their experiments. This is the group of Saldon Su in 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 uh, Washington, and there they find. Uh, an even more weird G factor. This one is like a negative 1.8. So why would that be 1.8 then? So this is a uh, this is a still like this one. I still cannot under understand. The 4.37 is the one that I'm going to explain here. But there is this one also. This one this one is a little more recent. You see. So this one they have uh, uh, some magnetic field dependence of the exciton states. And here is more, I, I put this slide here also to, to make you understand how people realize what is the G factor and, and what is the diamagnetic shift and so on, right? So this is the raw data. And when you look at the position of the peaks in the experiment, you see these points in energies, right? And then as you increase the magnetic field, you see their lab, they have a very uh, large one. So it cannot be like a static one. This is done with uh, like a time-dependent field. And uh, this was in Stephen Cooker group. So then the you have here uh, two peaks. One is created with sigma plus and the other with sig sigma minus. One of them goes down and the other goes up. This one, you see that the diamagnetic shift is barely seen here because it's basically linear. But in this one, you see the diamagnetic shift, which are the quadratic ones, right? But now, if you subtract the two curves and divide by two, then you can get the Zeeman shifts Right, because if you subtract them, then you subtract the uh, the quadratic contributions, which have the same sign. You remember that energy to be composed by a linear contribution, which is the Zeeman effect, and a quadratic contribution, which is a diamagnetic shift. So once you subtract one to one by the other, then you eliminate the quadratic parts. You emphasize the linear parts, and this is what gives you the Zeeman uh, splitting that we have here. Now, if you want to see the diamagnetic shift, so how do you do? You actually you sum up these two things because we know that the linear contributions from sigma plus and sigma minus, the linear contributions, they have opposite signs. If I sum them, I eliminate the, 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 uh, the contribution from the linear part and I get, get only the, the quadratic ones. And this is what is shown here. So with the same experiment, I can get a diamagnetic shift and also a Zeeman shift. And when they look at the mag diamagnetic shifts here, they found some values that I'm going to discuss a little later in this, uh, in this presentation. 
But for the Zeeman shift, they consistently find like 4.1, 4.5, 4.2. So they never find really 4. And actually, the, here they see uh, a, uh, a value that changes with the excitonic state. But the problem is that when they have this experiment here, this is an experiment that is based on uh, spectroscopy. So the precision of the position of the peak is not really good. So you see that there, is, there are like a scattering here of points which, are, which is not really reliable. But at least for the, the ground state, this is fine, right? The ground state is really linear. Then the, the 2 west state is already like a little bit uh, hard to, to, to say that this is like a perfect line. But and then the red one is even worse and so on. So what we have here that I'm going to discuss is because we have we got an experimental result that is a lot more precise than this one. So I'm going to talk a little bit later on. So this one is the, the one that I told you that this one, I, I'm, I'm really far from understanding this one. These are G factors that are not on the scale of 4. You see that this one is like 6.73, 6.72. This one is minus 16 almost. How can I explain a G factor of minus 16 then? Because these are composed by G orbi by D orbitals, right? So the magnetic momentum should be something like 4. Why is this 16 then? And this is really 16, right? I mean, you see, you cannot argue that this is not a linear behavior, right? And where do they get this thing? This is an experiment also in the Seldon Su group in, in Seattle. And this is uh, made with those Van der Waals heterostructures that, that, to that I told you in the beginning. These are like com a combination of two layers of TMDCs. And then they make some rotation. And the depending on the rotation angle, this one is like 2 and 3 degrees. They are almost like uh, 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 aligned. In this case, they see G factors like that. But if you rotate to 60 degrees, they are almost aligned, but with like an AB stacking. And in this case, you would get a, a minus 16. So why is that? So my, my idea for explaining these things would be like you would look for the DFT relations of these band structures, look for the electron hole states involved in this thing, and then see if the, the orbital uh, contribution would be enough, and then you add this, this 1 over mass contribution and so on. But we are still working on this one. Okay, so let's go now for the theory. This, is, this was just like a motivation for why do I do a theory for that thing. So here, uh, I'm going, I, I presented this thing as like a set of, of, of equations and so on, because I didn't want to bore you so much on this, th on this thing. So uh, the idea here is that we have a tight binding model for uh, a TMDC. And this one is, I think Milton showed something similar also for, for black phosphorus yesterday, right? So the idea is more or less the same, but this one I go up to third nearest neighbors only, and uh, the orbitals that I involve in this thing, they are the only the d orbitals of the uh, of the transition metal atoms. So th remember that in that DFT figure I showed before, these are the ones that contribute most for electron hole states, right? So if I make a tight binding matrix out of these things then I need to look at the contributions for each part of the lattice. I do something like a Fourier transform of the lattice. That's what is shown here. So these alphas and betas here, is, they are like uh, uh, functions of kx and ky. Okay? So these are the ones that relate one point to the other in the lattice. So once you get like the real part of v1, you, you get the real part of this term, and then you have like imaginary part of v1. This will compose this point. And then V2, you do the same and so on. So this is something that you do as a tight binding model. Once you have this matrix, you diagonalize it. Then you get the band structures. And remember, it's a three by three matrix, so I can only get three states. But they match very well with the DFT results, right? If I, if I put the, the parameters uh, uh, to, to op if I optimize the parameters. So these are really good uh, fittings to the DFT results. So. That's why we, we uh, kept on using that thing. Actually, there is a, another tight binding model which, I, which has only uh, two bands, but that one is not good enough because, as I told you, I wanted to look at this intercellular contribution. And intercellular means that I need a band, right? And then that I, I would need to look for the best approximation for the band. If I do a parabolic approximation for the band, it may not be good enough. That's the point. And then, so from here, I get the exciton uh, effective masses because I can look at the, the curvatures here. And then for the exciton binding energies, I will make a parabolic approximation on this thing. 
put for the comp comp calculation. Oh, yes? Yes. Not, so, not much. Be because the, the, the most important contribution here comes from the curvatures of the bands, not exactly the gap. So, th Yeah, the curvature is okay. Uh, yes. But it's still like if, if we have something even more reliable here, it would be even better. But uh, you see that also I didn't take into account when I calculated these bands, I didn't take into account the spin uh, contributions. This one should be like split into two and so on. I should I should also do that in the in the future. But as uh, we were a little bit on a hurry to publish this, then <laughs> we gave a first approximation to the results. So now what I'm going to do is like to get the effective masses from here. Then I have the kinetic energy, and for the potential energy, I use something that also was mentioned here by Andre Chavez, uh, which is more or less like my name, right? But this is the guy who from from uh, the the Air Force Institute who presented yesterday. Okay, so he was also solving this uh, Poisson equation to get like a screen at Coulomb interaction. This is what I do also here. So what I do is like I make a Fourier transform of the whole system. This was actually done by Ritov and Kaldish in the past, right? So what I do here is just I go one step before their approximation. Uh, Ritov and Kaldish, they also solved this thing in K-space and then they have something like that in their papers. And this is like a Fourier transform of the, the solution in K-space. And then this epsilon of K, this would be like a, a, an effective electrostatic uh, approximation for the, the dielectric function. And then the dielectric function would look like that. But what Ritov and Kaldish did before was to say that D multiplied by K would go to zero, and these, en these epsilons would be also much larger than the other. W one set of epsilons is much smaller than the other. And then because of that, you eliminate some terms here and you get a linear approximation. And with this linear approximation, this integral comes analytically and then you get this, this potential here. And then you get also a definition of a screening length and so on. But what I'm going to do here, just, le just for the sake of like, because uh, we can do that, so it's not a, not a big deal. We are, uh, we are going to use this full expression here. But normally this expression here is a, uh, uh, an approximation that is good enough. So. Also, let me also convince you that it's possible just to use that uh, conduction band and valence band, like the effective masses from that as a, a part of the kinetic energy, and the po that potential as a part of the electron hole interaction. Then from there, I get the exact values of the, the, of the exciton peaks. Why is that? That's because let, let me make a connection to something that Andreas showed yesterday. When you look at, when you start with that equation of motion approach, where you have d dt of the polarization, this would be like a bracket of, of the Hamiltonian with the, the polarization operator. You, you go on with those calculations and at some point you reach this, this equation here. This is the polarizability or, or the polarization vector. No, it's still not the vector. It's more like a, a uh, it's a polarization, of, uh, a polarization function actually. So then here you get this, uh, this term that comes from EC minus EV, like conduction band and valence band. If you put them together, you get something like a relative the electron, a mass for the, the relative, uh, like a relative mass, b a, a mass related to the relative motion of the electron hole. And this would be like a, a kinetic energy term. And this V that you obtain from here, this is the Coulomb potential, this or actually in that case, the Keldish potential. So this is the equation that you get. And you can rewrite this, e this equation, or you can solve this equation. It's not really rewrite. It's not the, the best term for this. You actually you solve this equation in terms of the, the eigenstates of this uh, Vanier equation, which looks like a hydrogen-like equation, right? Which because in indeed, the electron hole, they look like a hydrogen atom. So if I solve this thing, I get eigenfunctions and eigenenergies. And then I put this, this thing back here as a combination here to make this PVC. And then I go on with the calculations and get the, the uh, absorption spectrum in the end. Because this is like, you do that to look for the absorption spectrum that comes from here, right? So what I'm saying is, if I solve these equations, I can make a set of states like that. And then I write this PVC as a function of this, or, or as a combination of this. Then I put this thing back here. Then these would be the coefficients if you compare two sides of the equations. 
Now I have P of omega given by this. And if you rewrite this thing a little bit, you can put together this epsilon. Uh, this would be the electric field. You put it out. Now you have P, which is like a polarization. This is something multiplied by the epsilon. The same way you have like a, a magnetic polarization and a magnetic field here, and what multiplies it, it this is a, like a, a magnetic susceptibility. This thing is seen as an optical susceptibility. This function here, this is what gives you the peaks of absorption uh, of the absorption spectrum, right? So, and then this function here will then be given by this. This, this is a, like a matrix element. This is the exciton wave function, but only at the at r equal to zero, which means the electrons and holes are in the same place in space. Function that has peaks whenever the uh, Whenever the energy reaches, or, or the omega multiplied by, by h bar of your light, of your incident light, it reaches the one of the eigenstates of the exciton, right? You remember this mu here, it comes from here. This is the energy of each state like that. So whenever I have this thing equals to this one, then I'll have a peak. And this is what, this thing here, if you rewrite this a little bit, you get the Elliott formula that was mentioned by uh, Andre yesterday. But actually there, what, what he does is uh, uh, he, he does things in a step before this one, which is like a, a more like a semiconductor bo block equations. And what I am doing here is a more approximate method. I only calculate binding energies and, and wave functions, and then I, I'm just interested in what are the states that really contribute to, to absorption. But notice that only the states that have this thing as a non-zero value, these are the only states that really matter here. Because otherwise the, the, the susceptibility would go to zero, right? The only states that have this thing non-zero would be the S states. So what I, what I am able to describe with this theory is the S state series of the TMDC, of the excitons in TMDC. So every state I see there, it should be like an S state. Okay, so can we observe that in the experiment or not, right? So in the experiment, what I get is a series of peaks this was done by uh, Union. He's a professor at this Massachusetts uh, University of Massachusetts in Harmhurst. Uh, so what he has there is the, the is like a set a set of peaks, and this comes from photoluminescence. This one doesn't come from absorption, and that's why this one is more precise. If you do it properly, it can be more precise than the absorption ones because the the ones in absorption actually what they do is like they have some dips in absorption spectrum. And then they take derivatives of those dips to see wha where is the, the really the minimum of absor absorption in this one. And that one gives you a, a little bit of an error. While this one has a peak which is very narrow in, in, in energy. So I, I'm more sure where the, the position of the peak is. And these, I'm sure these are S states because my previous theory says that the only the S states are really uh, excitable with, with light, right? So what he does is he went to this lab in, in Tallahassee to make uh, magnetic fields up to 30 Tesla. And then he sees these parabolic shapes of, of the behavior of the position of these peaks. And these parabolas, they are the ones that we use to make the, uh, uh, the study of diamagnetic shift and Zeeman shift and so on. So OK, here I'm showing three of the, the, is the, of the of, of three examples of experimental results that he gets there. This one is with the photoluminescence peak. This one with the is with the absorption peak that he made that just for comparison. So then he made the absorption peak like this. And then you take a derivative of the absorption peak. Then you need to look at the inversion point here. And then you take the second derivative of the, of the, the, the absorption peak. Then from here you can observe where, is, where it should be the, the, the minimum of, of, uh, of the absorption spectrum. And there, there you should get the, the energy. But indeed, if you compare the results that come from this with the photoluminescence ones, you get more or less the same results, right? This is PL and this is the reflectance. So then here you have only like a shift that is less than one mill electron volt between them. That it's probably, it, it, you can say this, uh, you can see this as a Stokes shift, right? Shift. So this is a shift between what is absorbed and what is uh, uh, Photoluminescent, right? So here is what we get for Zeeman effect, and here is what we get for the diamagnetic shift from the two methods. 
but these two parabolas, they are more or less the same. So the, the, the magnetic shifts that you get from both methods uh, are more or less the same, and the linear behavior is more or less the same too. But you see that they did only up to 15 Tesla, because uh, the absorption spectrum, uh, the absorption experiment was done in their lab, not in the in Tallahassee. So that 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 was made just to to be sure that photoluminescence spectrum is not giving you something crazy. Okay, <laughs> so okay, now we have this line from the absorption spectrum for Zeeman effect and the one from the magnetic one. Remember that what I do is like sum or subtract the curves that I get from here, and now. Uh, if you plot the diamagnetic shift as a function of b squared, then you see that they are perfectly linear. And this linear function here of the magnetic field, uh, the slope of these linear functions here, they would be given by this alpha here. That would be like the polarizability, magnetic polarizability, of, or, or uh, the parameter of the diamagnetic shift here, right? So this alpha here, we have also some theoretical data for it using that theory that I just showed. And these theoretical data would be uh, this point, these and these for 1s, 2s, and 3s states. They are not so close, but also not so far from the experimental ones. So how is the experimental one get got here? Here we have a color map, right? This color map is this alpha function, which is a function of both r and m, right? You have an r and an m here. So if you change this r and m uh, in for any value here, you get a different value here of alpha in this map. But in the experiment, you only get uh, some specific numbers because I know what are the alphas, right? So if you set this alpha, now you get r as a function of m, right? So these are the curves. So these are possible curves if the radius of the exciton, remember that this is like the average value of the excitonic radius. So uh, if the radius of the exciton, uh, as, as, as the mass of the exciton increases, the radius of the exciton to match the same alpha here should go up like that. And then what we have is we have these values from theory that matches more or less the curve that they get from the experiment. I'm saying here is that the experiment is not uh, perfect enough to tell you what is the R and what is the M. The only thing we can get is a function be between them. Because this function is given by this alpha, right? You put m here, then you have r as a function of m. But otherwise, this for this for these curves, and uh, we can just compare to the theory here. Now, for the exciton spectrum, the position of the energies. Maybe this one should be shown first, right? This one is the position of the excitonic peaks that I showed you in the last in the previous slide, or in this one actually. These are the position of these peaks. You see that here they already show the difference between two uh, magnetic fields, but let's focus on the zero magnetic field sta uh, sta uh, result. So as the magnetic field is zero, then you get 1s, 2s, 3s, and 4s. These are the, the, the points that I get from theory with that mass and with, uh, 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 with the, the Keldish potential, or actually the, the, the potential that I told you that is like one step before Keldish potential. And they match very well the, the states here for uh, binding energy of the, uh, of the ground state as one 170 milli electron volts. So this also allows me to set what is the quasi-particle gap of the system. Quasi-particle gap of that material then should be something like 1.9. So the quasi-particle gap should be something like a convergence value of the, one S, the, the S spectrum of the exciton, right? So this is a way to measure what is the quasi-particle spectrum of, or quasi-particle gap of the material. Okay, so how does that function appear, right? W if you have the energy of the exciton, you have a linear contribution from Zeeman effect, and this one is the magnetic shift. Now, the magnetic shift should be built by a uh, 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 spin contribution, an atomic orbital contribution, and now that thing that I called uh, before I call this intercellular contribution, that would be what I call here like a self-rotation. This self-rotation, this is like an angular momentum of the electron in a band structure. And this one is the one that turns out to be tricky to calculate. So you need to, to have a Hamiltonian. This is the one that I use it as the three by three Hamiltonian. This would be the eigenstates of that Hamiltonian, eigenenergies and so on. If you do this sum, and you, there is an explanation for why that works in that paper. So uh, you then you calculate the angular momentum. 
then this from this angular momentum you calculate the magnetic momentum now uh, what is the problem here? If you have an exciton state, they populate different regions in K space, right? And this would be this will give you me, give me then a state dependent contribution for the G factor, because if they are populating different regions in G, in K space, then this means that uh, I'm going for regions where the self rotation contribution can be different or the orbital contribution can be different, because if you look at the the whole band structure. It's not everywhere that the state is composed only by the orbitals. In some points, they would be composed by like by other orbitals, right? So when you when you do the the uh, the full calculation, then you one s. This would be like uh, you multiply by two, then you get the the g factors of four that I told you before. Here for that paper, we use it another notation, but just compare the double of these numbers here to the 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 ones before, okay? So if you get for 1s, 2s, and 3s, they are consistently going higher, right? And this was exactly what was observed in the experiment. If you take the Zeeman shifts for 1s, 2s, and 3s, they have different values. And they are increasing, consistently increasing. And this experiment was repeated many times there in the lab. So they are consistently increasing. So what is my theory for that? Is the fact that if you look at the contribution of the orbital angular momentum it's it's like that as a function of k around the the k point in, in reciprocal space the contribution from spin is always the same because the spin is only uh, half and the contribution from uh, self rotation part that would be like that and this is the one that i calculate with the that with that theory that i showed in the previous slide so but then when you look at the exciton wave functions they are so this is the total one the green one is the total when you go for one S state, the wave function in real space is very narrow, which means that it's very large in K space. So it is populating all these points here. When you take the average of this mu here, you get a small contribution here. And that's why this number has a small slope, a smaller slope, I mean, right? As you go for the two S state, then it's larger in real space, narrower in K, K space. I have this wave function. I make an average of this green line here. Now I get a higher number, and that's why G2S is higher. And now I go for 3S. It's even narrower in K space. Now I, I am making an average only around this point, and then you get something even higher than the others, and that's what I see also here. So if you make a, a, a figure like that, in the experiment, in the experiment they, even, they also look like they are like converging to some number. Mine is not really precise, but it's more or less the same qualitative uh, result. And what I'm claiming here is that as you go for more and more excited states, you would populate in the end only this point, and this would be this line here. So in the end, you should get something like 2.6637 as the angular momentum of the perfectly uh, uh, direct gap, like k well, electron exactly at k, hole exactly at k. That would be the perfect uh, transition. But as we don't have a perfect transition like that, you have some distribution of k, k points. Then you have a different number here, which is a little bit lower than the, right? Which is exactly at k. Explains why Zeeman effect is exciton state dependent. So the Zeeman effect depends on which exciton state we're taking. So now for that thing with the uh, the stacked atoms, this the stacked layers, I tried also to to look for a a, a theory for that. And I based my, my theory in the fact that if you look at this experiment, uh, this one was also published by, by, this was already published like last year. In this one, we look at the exciton peaks that appear as you, st you stack two layers of atoms. So the point is, when you stack two layers of atoms like that, electrons and holes, they would populate the layers where their energy is, is, is lower, right? So electrons would move if you if you have like a uh, uh, you excite excitons as a in an in absorption experiment then they will relax to their lowest energy states and once they make a photoluminescence this would be with an indirect exciton uh, photoluminescence right and this was also observed in other in other groups so this is a, a very clear res result like that you see that this was measured only on the tungstenium diselenide this was measured only on the molybdenum diselenide. These are the peaks. 
once you measure them in the stacked layers, you get the same peaks, which are like the direct excitons, but you get an extra peak that only appears in this situation. And this extra peak, this is supposed to be the one that comes from this transition here. So this is what I'm looking for. Because that would be, uh, this is another experiment where they see the same. So this is nice because such an indirect exciton, as I told you, transition should, be, uh, should only happen if electrons and holes are in this with a wave function that is not zero as they are on top of each other. In this case, the wave function is basically zero, right? Because they are not on top of each other. They are in different layers. So they, their lifetime is much larger. And then they could be better for like b for solar cells or photodetectors where you need to, to, to wait until the exciton recombine and make photoluminescence. And also maybe for bose eisen condensation. And for this one, actually, there is already a, a very recent paper uh, uh, about, about uh, bose eisen condensation of excitons in titanium, I, I think titanium disulfide or something. And people have been looking for these things also in, in bilayers of, of TMDCs. So just back to this thing, uh, we realized that this peak here, the lowest energy peak there that comes from the interlayer exciton, it has this behavior as a function of the twisting angle between the layers. And this means that if you look at the theory for this, you see that the only transition that matches this thing is an indirect transition in the K space, which means that holes are composed by gamma states and electrons are composed by K states. And that would be the, the hope to explain why the, the uh, interlayer excitons that, was, that were observed in the experiment, they had a different g-factor than normal. Maybe they are composed by different points in, 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 the, in the band structure that are not exactly the same orbitals as before, and that would be like maybe a path to, to look for when we calculate the, the g-factor. But this, was, this is something like an uh, ongoing pro uh, project. But if you look at other experiments, like uh, this one, for example, these three experiments, they also observe inter interlayer excitons, and they also uh, claim that in their case, it looks like the exciton is indirect in k-space. They measure that by making the experiment with different temperature, and they, they see that the, the peak is temperature dependent, which looks like it has phonons involved and so on. That would be the ingredient that misses here for uh, indirect exciton, right? Now, like for the last part here, let me just also uh, talk about this possibility of observing magneto excitons in, in, in these materials. So the idea is, if you look at the exciton as a function of magnetic field, you, you don't have only that point in, in uh, you, don't, you don't have only that, that, uh, that magnetic shift and, and the Zeeman effect that I was uh, talking about before. You have some terms that lead to that, so this is the Hamiltonian. You make like some uh, relative and center of mass uh, transformations and some gauge transformations. The Hamiltonian will look like that. And uh, so this term here, along with the potential, will give you the exciton binding energy. This will give you the, uh, so this and this will give you the exciton binding energy. This will give you the diamagnetic shift correction and then the, the Zeeman shift is not here because it's just a linear uh, contribution. But here now I have a exciton center of mass contribution, right? And this exciton center of mass contribution, normally it's zero because, uh, uh, I mean, the exciton transitions, they would, they, would be like a, a, they would be like a direct transition, right? But depending on, the, on how you can control the exciton, uh, the exciton momentum. And then you could look at the exciton dispersion. And what they observed in 2002 for quantum wells is the fact that the effective mass of the center of mass of the exciton depends on the magnetic field. And why is that? Uh, I mean, if you do that with, with black phosphorus, that would be even more interesting because the, the black phosphorus has anisotropic masses. So the, these masses not only would be dependent on the magnetic field, but they would also be, uh, 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 they would also be anisotropic, right? So why is that? That's because when you look at full Hamiltonian, you open all those equations and so on, you would see the Landau levels, but in the context of excitons, you see the electron hole interaction that makes you the, the exciton and, and also the, the magnetic shift here, you see all these contributions. But this is one that, that is new and it looks like an electric field, right? 
And the contribution from the electric field to an exciton is the same as the one for a hydrogen atom, which is a, a stark shift, right? And the stark shift is quadratic. But if you have a term that is quadratic on the field, the, the, this is a field that is like a k-dependent field, now you have a quadratic co correction for k. But quadratic corrections for k you can put together with the effective masses, right? So that's why the magnetic field, in the end, it will look like it will make the excitons uh, have a higher mass. It's because of this stark shift here. But this is very hard to, to, to verify, but it was ver verified in 2002. So this can be a path to a new experiment to look at these magneto excitons. Magneto excitons would then mean that you have uh, an exciton that has its mass, effective mass, correlated to the magnetic field that you put there. I mean, it depends on, 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 on the field. So, but also, if you have an indirect gap transition, maybe this k could be non-zero, right? And then this would give you already some corrections to the, the uh, magnetic field dependence, and that could be also a way to explain the, the, those previous results. So now, as the conclusions, I would say that we, we, what we have is a theoretical model for these uh, acetones in, in, in TMDCs. And we, we use this vernier mott approach. We just solve like hydrogen at atom equation. And band structures we use, for the band structures, we use a tight binding model. And then we get effective masses from, for, from, from it to give the kinetic energy for the electron. And, but also, w uh, for the angular momentum, we need this 3 by 3 Hamiltonian so that we have this uh, curvature taken take into account when you calculate this angular momentum. And the experimental data uh, they for from photoluminescence in this material, it shows uh, state-dependent g-factors. And we interpret this thing as a contribution of uh, different exciton wave functions to the total angular momentum. So excitons with diff uh, the envelope function of excitons depend on the, the state. The width of this envelope function depends on the state. So the interlayer excitons in this van der Waals heter structure or, or stacked TMDCs, they may have even a larger variety of defectors. And that's because you have also states away from K state, right? It's possible that you have different orbital contributions and so on. And this magneto exciton, there is no such experiment for, for van der Waals heter structures yet. But there were, there were experiments like that for quantum wells in the past. So maybe that could be something that people could think about in this in, uh, as a future possible experiment for, for to, un to understand the behavior of excitons in magnetic fields. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And, and yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes.